I gotta go out and play well, and if I don't, then people are gonna be mad. I'm gonna be mad. Everybody's gonna be mad. So uh, my my um, focus is to play well. Feel the pressure. You feel the pressure being here. No, I don't feel pressure. You know, he even looks a little standing behind that podium. Could they have gotten a box for him or something? I mean, I I hope he's great, but he is so little. I love standing next to him. It makes me feel tough. Oh yeah, big tough Mike Florio. <laughs> next to I'd, I I would like to see that fight. I don't think you would last very. Oh long. no, it would no no it would not last. Like I would fare about as well as the other guy on the on the on the, on the wrong side of the bag when Khalil Mack blew him up. But but at least you know it's better to stand next to a guy who's my height. Then one of these when when you're doing this, you know, holding the microphone up like that. So I, I always like being around Russell Wilson, Drew Brees, Kyler Murray, and I hope Kyler Murray's great, uh, and he's been great every step of the way. He feels no pressure, so he's not going to be included in this edition of Pressure Cooker. Big Cat and I are going to go back and forth with some names. I'll let you go first. Who's under the most pressure heading into the season in your mind? Okay, I'll start with uh, a Hall of Famer, a legend. We saw his team last night. It's John Elway. John Elway is under the pressure cooker because he cannot figure out the quarterback position in, for the Denver Broncos besides that year with Peyton Manning when they are two years and they go to a Super Bowl and then win a Super Bowl. I don't think, you know, he has any idea what's going on. John Elway bringing, jo or sorry, bringing Joe Flacco, that's, that move makes no sense. Drew Locke, who knows what he's going to be. John Elway is under a pressure cooker because here's the thing. The Broncos... When you talk about the league's best teams and best franchises, the Broncos are kind of under the radar, one of the best franchises in all of the NFL. And I mean that by the year in and year out, they're consistently good. You've never seen the Broncos go a long stretch where they have been bad and missed the playoffs. And now if the, if the Broncos miss the playoffs again this year, maybe win five games, four games, we'll be in that stretch. We'll be in that stretch post-Super Bowl 50 – and John Elway will start having to answer a lot of tough questions about what the future of the Broncos look like. Yeah, they didn't have back-to-back -back losing seasons since 1971-1972 until last year. And uh, then they're looking at three in a row, which would not be good for Elway. The only thing that's saving him is this this kind of intra-family Willy Wonka competition as to who's going to take over and no one stepped up yet and there's a group of trustees that will figure out who will take over ownership of the team, who will be in charge. And I think while it's still in this kind of vague, ambiguous gulf, it's, it's harder to run John Elway off. Uh, so I don't know that he has to worry about being fired in the short term. What he has to worry about is whether or not when there is an owner named by these trustees that that owner is going to want to stick with Elway or want to move in a new direction. So I, I, I agree with you. Regardless of whether he has the job or not, he's under a ton of pressure to prove that he can find a quarterback other than Peyton Manning falling into his lap. All right, uh, mine, and this is obvious, and, and I, it's so obvious I almost didn't want to pick him, but if I don't pick him, people are going to be like, why the hell didn't you pick the obvious one? The obvious one to me is Jason Garrett, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. He's in the final year of his contract. He's not getting an extension. Jerry Jones has basically made it clear the guy's coaching for his job this year without coming out and saying it. The circumstances scream it. And of anyone in that organization that should be anxious and urgent about Ezekiel Elliott getting back, it would be Garrett. Because Garrett needs Elliott to prop up the team so he can secure his next contract. And the Cowboys seem to think he does a better job when he's feeling that pressure, when he's feeling that heat, and he's going to be feeling it this year. Mike, they're all coaching for their job. Their job is to coach. Come on now. Uh, okay. All right, my next one, Mike Tomlin. Mike Tomlin signs an extension. You think, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers never fire coaches. We talk about it all the time. They've had, what, four coaches in the last 40 years or whatever it may be? I still think that this is a huge year for Mike Tomlin because Ben Roethlisberger is not going to be the quarterback forever. You had everything happen with Le'Veon Bell last year. You had everything happen with Antonio Brown last year. Everyone is sitting there saying, okay, you've eliminated these two guys that might be problems in the locker room. My feeling of the whole situation is the problems go deeper than that, and it's on Mike Tomlin because there is something weird that goes on with the Steelers, and it feels like the accountability is kind of all out of whack, and Mike Tomlin is going to have a pressure cooker of a season. They have a ton of talent. Their defense should be good, and will he be able to step up and get the Steelers back to the playoffs? And beat the Patriots, because that's really what it comes down to at this point for the Steelers. It feels like every season, can they beat the Patriots? And, you know, some years they beat them in the regular season and they fail in the playoffs. They need to get deep into the playoffs for Mike Tomlin to stick around. I've 
I believe that the extension that was announced last week, it's a one-year extension with a team option for the next year beyond that. Um, I think that was done just to get people like us to quit talking about Mike Tomlin being on the hot seat. They don't want that hovering over the season. It's kind of like what happens when when there's, when there's a coach who's in the last year of his contract. Oh, we got to give him a new contract. He can't be a lame duck. Tomlin was kind of having that lame duck feel. They needed validation from ownership that he's our guy, so we'll quit talking about Tomlin being on the hot seat. But this is a team that is immensely talented. It's underachieved. Why is it underachieved? Well, who's responsible for getting the most achievement possible out of a talented group of players? It's the head coach, and it's going to land on him if this team ends up being six and ten seven and nine even eight and eight if they watch the Cleveland Browns run roughshod over that division followed by the Baltimore Ravens in second place and the Steelers in third place th- there's going to be a tough discussion and it was reported by Ed Bouchette of The Athletic that members of the limited partnership minority owners of the Steelers did not want to give Tomlin that extension we reported back in early 2018 minority owners of the Steelers wanted him fired after the 2017 season there is a clamoring there when things don't get well for change and this extension is not going to keep that from happening if the Steelers fall flat on their faces this year. So I agree with you on that one. So that was a great pick by me. And we, That's a great I just pick want, by you. I just want the Steelers to know that I know what they did when they gave Mike Tomlin an extension, and I'm still going to talk about him on the hot seat. So it didn't work. <laughs> didn't work. Well, uh, Derek Carr got a big contract from the Raiders a couple of years ago for a small piece of time, maybe six weeks. He was the highest paid player in NFL history until he was eclipsed by Matthew Stafford. He's got a $25 million a year contract. This is the last year of the guaranteed money. After 2019, he is on a year-to-year arrangement as the quarterback of the Raiders. Oh, and by the way, John Gruden earlier this week gratuitously interjects how much he loves Nathan Peterman while answering a press conference question that wasn't even about Nathan Peterman. I think Derek Carr is on the hot seat in Oakland. I think there's a chance he's not going to be the quarterback when they go to Las Vegas. And people are making a big deal out of the fact that Derek Carr is building a house next door to John Gruden in Las Vegas. When when does that mean a damn bit of anything? If they don't want him, he's not going to be the quarterback, regardless of where he's building a house. This is up or out for Derek Carr. Mike Mayock said back before the draft, the reason they looked at Kyler Murray and Dwayne Haskins was because they have to always look for upgrades at every position, including quarterback. That is the duty to the team. It's in the best interest of the franchise to be looking for better players. They're going to find a better player potentially than Derek Carr, and they're going to take him because I don't think Carr is a guy that's ever going to mesh fully and completely with John Gruden, and I think this is the year that that gets proven completely to the point where the Raiders decide to move on. I actually I think this is a bad pick because I already just assumed Derek Carr's out. Is that crazy of me? Like, I don't think it's going to work. Is, is this like the hot the hot sun is actually cold theory? Is that it's, no. it's, it's so clear that he's going to be out that he's not under pressure? I, yeah, I think it's not an if, it's just a when. So it's yeah. almost like but, he, he can play without any pressure knowing that he's probably out. No, no, no. He he believes that he's, he's the guy. Maybe he feels no pressure because he's delusional. He said earlier this year he's going to be the quarterback of the Raiders as long as he wants to be, which shows he has no understanding of how the NFL actually works. So okay, I think this fair. is it. For, I really do think this is it for him. Who else do you have? All right. I got one a little, a little off the board here, Mike. I want to hear your thoughts on this. I have Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo under the pressure cooker because Jimmy Garoppolo has been anointed as a franchise quarterback. He got paid a ton of money, and then he gets hurt, which obviously not his fault, but – We don't know what Jimmy Garoppolo is. We have not seen Jimmy Garoppolo play a full regular season of football in the NFL. So, pressure cooker because Kyle Shanahan is a fantastic coach, one of, I think, the best offensive minds we have in the NFL right now. If Jimmy Garoppolo can't do it with him right away, especially considering the fact that he hasn't proven it like year in and year out, I think Jimmy Garoppolo is low-key under the pressure cooker to perform and perform fast to prove to the 49ers and the fan base that he is worth every dollar that they paid him. You know how you sometimes get annoyed with me when you realize that I don't listen to every episode of the Pardon My Take podcast? Are you familiar with that concept? Yes. Yes. You apparently pay no attention to anything that I write about at ProFootballTalk.com. I've been banging this drum for weeks that this is it for Jimmy Garoppolo, that next year, you know what the cap charge would be if they cut Jimmy Garoppolo after this season? $4.2 million. That is peanuts given what they have 
invested into Jimmy Garoppolo. They can move on from him quickly. They can move on from him easily. And the other side of this Jimmy Garoppolo hot take, which has gotten a lot of 49ers fans pissed off at me, I firmly believe that if Kirk Cousins doesn't have a great year with the Minnesota Vikings, there could be a trade in the offing where Kyle Shanahan finally gets the guy that he wanted, the guy he thought he was going to get before they traded for Jimmy Garoppolo. I could see Garoppolo out after this year and Cousins in next year as the quarterback of the 49ers. But to answer your question, no, I don't read or consume any <laughs> Mike Florio content except for when I'm on this show. All right. Well, hey, today we're on the same page as it relates to Jimmy Garoppolo. I got one more real quick. Dave Gettleman, the Giants GM. Now, I don't know that he would be fired. The Giants don't fire GMs just like the Steelers don't fire coaches. And I think one of the reasons they don't fire GMs, I think John Mara essentially runs the team and uses the GM as the buffer so he doesn't look like he's meddling. But Gettleman's really out on the limb here with the Odell Beckham Jr. trade and how they're handling Daniel Jones, the sixth overall pick in the draft, and Eli Manning still the quarterback, and do they have enough talent? And if this team is just a disaster this year, it's all going to fall on Gettleman. And uh, regardless of whether he, he – he may be at the point where he doesn't want to continue to be the GM of the Giants because of all the criticism and all the scrutiny that he has to endure. I think he's under a ton of pressure. Hot seat or not, pressure galore for Dave Gettleman. One last one, your guy, Mike Zimmer. Another low-key one. Me. Another uh, yeah, low-key well, one. I, I, I don't – listen, I think Mike Zimmer's a fantastic coach, but when the Vikings were knocking on the door a couple years ago – and, you know, you can say the Teddy Bridgewater thing set him back. You can obviously say Kirk Cousins play last year. I think it's one of those situations. It kind of reminds me of like a Lovey Smith where it's maybe not the, the coach's uh, fault that they're underperforming and maybe they even win eight, nine, ten games. It's just the fact that guys might not be, you know, listening the way they, sh they should be and the message starts to get a little muddled there. And a year after year after year – there was no disastrous year, but it feels like there should just be a change for change sakes, which I'm not saying is a great idea. I think the Bears kind of set themselves back when they fired Lovey Smith and went into the Tressman Woods and the John Fox Woods, but it, ha it happens in the NFL, and I think Mike Zimmer is right around that time if the Vikings underperform this year. I, I personally think that the Wolves are all in with Zimmer and that they are not inclined to have a – a revolving door they've been very good about now that they've they've got a coach that they like they're sticking with rick spielman's been the gm of that team for over a decade now they like stability and i think they're going to stick with hi i'm mike tarico and thanks for watching make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from nbc sports